Good evening. My name is Sue Racanelli, president of the League of Women Voters of Vermont. The League has been in Vermont since 1920, and voters trust us to give them objective and factual information on elections. And this is primarily because the League is nonpartisan. We do not support or oppose candidates or political parties. Today is the second of two webinars that the League is co-hosting with the Vermont Secretary of State and her office. Sarah Francis, Secretary of State in her first term, has made civic education and engagement her priority. She has been advocating that Vermont should consider implementing ranked choice voting, which is a new and powerful way of choosing our leaders. Vermont legislature will also be deciding in their next session whether to start ranked choice voting in the 2028 presidential primary. Here's Sarah to tell us about this evening's program, Ranked Choice Voting in Vermont, Impact, Considerations, and Opportunities. Sarah? Thank you so much, Sue. And I'm so excited to be here tonight. Um, I am here joined tonight by Hillary Francis and Sarah Montgomery, who are going to help us uh, unpack some of the details of how ranked choice voting might work in Vermont for the 2028 presidential primary. So I'm going to invite uh, Hillary and Sarah to join us now, and um, and we will have some brief introductions, and then we'll dive into a, a presentation that the two clerks have prepared for us to understand how ranked choice voting compares to the current way that we administer the presidential primary and some of the considerations that we need to uh, determine as we move towards ranked choice voting for 2028. So uh, Hillary Francis, in, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. And uh, why don't you um, tell the viewers who are with us tonight a little bit about yourself? Absolutely. Um, thank you so much for having me. Um, my name is Hillary Francis. I am the town clerk in Brattleboro, Vermont. Um, I am in my eighth year as the town clerk. Um, and my background um, before my, my life as a town clerk is in nonprofit advocacy and organizing. Um, and in Maine, I actually worked a little bit on ranked choice voting. Great. And we have also Sarah Montgomery. So Sarah, why don't you introduce yourself? Tell folks uh, who you are, where you are, and uh, how long you've been in your position. Thank you. Um, my name is Sarah Montgomery. I'm the Assistant City Clerk in Burlington. Um, I've been in this position for about two and a half years, recently working on implementation for ranked choice voting. So I'm excited to join you all tonight and talk about ranked choice voting. Great. So these uh, fabulous experts in elections administration have uh, prepared a little slideshow for us um, to talk about how we currently do um, presidential primary and some of the other things that are going on in the clerk's world on the day that we do our presidential primary in Vermont. And, uh, and then we'll dive in a little bit with some of the experience of Burlington. And then uh, the, the presentation will transition into some of the things that we need to consider as we move forward. So uh, Hillary, why don't you go ahead and share the screen, jump right in. Absolutely. So can you see my screen? Yes. The shared screen? Okay, excellent. Um, so uh, we're going to talk about a couple of things this evening, um, really thinking about ranked choice vote in a presidential primary election from a town clerk's perspective. Um, so we'll talk, as um, Sarah mentioned, about the current presidential primary procedures, um, and I'll specifically talk about what that looks like in Brattleboro. Um, we'll talk about ranked choice voting implementation for local elections in Burlington. Um, and then we'll have a discussion about the impact considerations and opportunities for statewide ranked choice voting. Um, so, you know, every town in Vermont is different. Um, I'm going to specifically be talking about what things look like in Brattleboro for the presidential primary. Um, so Brattleboro has a larger population than many Vermont communities. Um, we use tabulators, whereas some of the towns in Vermont um, hand count. 
Um, and then in a presidential primary, right, it happens every four years, uh, we also have the town meeting day ballot and the unified school district ballot. So there, there's multiple ballots happening at the same time. Um, some towns vote their town meeting day or schools by by floor votes. Um, so, you know, it, it's just it goes to show that that every town is different. Um, so we start out a, a big focus for us is communication um, throughout this entire process. The town communicates with the public and we, we do this in a variety of ways. We use press releases, social media a blog on the town's website. We also, um, our phones ring regularly and our emails are constantly coming in um, as we answer questions about the elections that are coming up um, and developing signs to post at the polls. Um, and voter education is really tailored to the specific election. Um, for example, in the presidential primary, voters had to declare which party's ballot they wanted, right? Did they want to vote in a Democratic ballot or a Republican ballot? And that's different from the August state primaries where voters are given all three ballots and get to choose in private which party's ballot they want. So even though voters do this every four years, um, you know, a lot of them forget uh, that this is the way that it happens in Vermont. And so there's a lot of voter education and a lot of communication around that. Um, so the early stages around a presidential primary, we really start, I mean, this year we started even before this, but generally in November, we start receiving requests for ballots from the public. Um, that can happen through phone calls, emails, um, people's My Voter page. Um, and around that time, the town clerk's office also begins reaching out to poll workers um, we usually have in Brattleboro about 30 to 40 poll workers that we're trying to um, schedule, figure out what shifts they're available, what their skill sets are. Um, and then we start organizing meetings and trainings for those poll workers. Um, for the early stages, uh, Brattleboro is all, all towns in the state are now allowed to do this. Uh, but Brattleboro is one of the few towns that allows for early in-person voting. Um, what that means is, you know, voters anywhere can vote absentee and request ballots to be mailed to them. Um, the early in-person voting means that a voter can come into the office, vote their ballot, and then physically put their ballots through the tabulator, just like they would on election day. Um, and because all of our ballots, right, we have we have those three different elections happening at the same time, all of the ballots in Brattleboro go through the same tabulator. Um, but because our memory cards um, can't be programmed until we have the local ballot data, um, the in-person early voting actually begins in Brattleboro 15 to 20 days before the elections, while absentee voting begins 45 days in advance of the election. Um, and then once the memory cards and the ballots have arrived, um, we test the ballots to ensure accuracy. Um, so what that means is we take a stack of ballots, we vote them in in every or in I shouldn't say every in many different ways that somebody might vote. Right. We might have a blank ballot. We might have an overvoted ballot. Um, we'll make sure that every every option is filled in at least once. Um, and then we hand count those and then compare the, ha the hand count to the tabulator tape once we run the ballots through the tabulators. And that helps us ensure the integrity of the tabulators and the counting. Um, and then we also have to test the ballots through the accessible voting machine um, to make sure that that works properly. Uh, about 45 days before the election, we start mailing ballots to those who have requested them. Um, some towns mail absentee ballots to all voters. Um, Brattleboro does not. Um, we only mail to those that requested. But for the presidential primary, we actually, uh, no town can mail ballots to all voters because they need to declare which party's ballot they want to receive. So we have to know what their request is in order to mail them. Um, 
And then this in, this really involves drafting instructions to go along with the ballots and preparing envelopes. So what that means is, you know, we have to stamp addresses on the mailing envelopes and return envelopes. Um, this past March, we mailed out over eight over eight hundred ballots um, in Brattleboro alone for just the presidential primary. Um, we have to make sure that the correct ballots that the person requested um, are in those envelopes, that there's a certificate envelope, that there are instructions, and then we always double check to make sure that we put the right ballot in. Um, so there's there's definitely a checks and balances system. About 30 days before the election, um, that's when we start opening the ballots that have been returned, already voted by the absentee voters. So we open the, the outer envelopes. Um, we data enter that into the statewide system. Um, we have to balance those numbers daily and cross-check envelopes against lists printed from the statewide database um, where we enter the participation um, this is also where we identify defective ballots and communicate with the voter so that they have a chance to cure their ballots. Um, so there's a lot of steps and checks and balances, again, in the processing of those. Um, and once we're balanced, then we start putting ballots through the tabulators. Um, the law now allows us to do that 30 days in advance. Um, and we continue to communicate and coordinate with volunteers and the public going too fast. Um, three to four weeks before the election, um, we update the poll worker instructions based on the logistics of that specific election. Um, so every election, whether it's town meeting day, presidential primary, state primaries, the November general, every election looks different from, from election to election and from year to year. Um, so we can't use the same instructions at each election, we have to update them, tweak them, make sure that they're relevant to um, the election at hand. Um, it can be really time consuming. Um, and then the Board of Civil Authority will hold a pre-election meeting. Um, and then we start preparing spreadsheets for the end of night results, for the information we're giving to the media. We start preparing our checklists, make sure that they're printing properly and they have all the data that they need. Um, okay. And then one week before the election, um, we will host a training for all election workers. And we meet with select workers for smaller meetings specific to their roles. And then we have a bigger all election worker meeting, um, so that everybody can understand how they fit into the bigger picture. And they can also jump in and cover for somebody last minute if they need to. Um, in the past few years, we have been doing these trainings through Zoom, um, mostly because it makes me really nervous after we all, you know, shut down during COVID um, that somebody might show up if we do it in person and be sick and then get all of our poll working team sick the week before the election. So we will hopefully go back to doing it in person someday, but right now we still do it fully through Zoom. Um, and then a week before the election, we also start preparing supplies for election day. I have long lists of all the supplies that we need. Um, we have to update signs, make sure that they're relevant, um, and, you know, pull everything together. The day before the election, we start preparing the polling location. Um, we're really fortunate in Brattleboro that our polling location is about two doors down the street from where our office is. So it makes it easier to move things around. Um, we do this with a team of workers and it takes about three hours. Um, and then after some town clerk's offices close early on the day before the election, or they're fully closed on the day before the election so that they can prepare for elections. Um, our office does not close early the day before. We close at 5 p.m. Um, and so after we close at five, we then start balancing our absentee ballots. We start printing our checklists and we're usually in the office until about seven o'clock PM, um, just getting everything ready. And now it's election day. Um, so at about five 15 in the morning, I, um, come into the office and we start, um, doing our last minute setup. I have a small team of people, 
um, that come and meet me and we bring all of the sensitive material that we can't have out of our vault unattended. So um, things like unvoted ballots, tabulators, voted ballots that were already put through the machine that are still in the, the tabulator bin, absentee ballots that have not yet been processed, checklists, and any other sensitive materials from our vault. Um, in Brattleboro, our polls are open from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. In Vermont, I believe um, polls are allowed to open anytime between 5 a.m. and 10 a.m., and then they all have to close at the same time at 7 p.m. Um, after polls close, it takes us about 30 minutes to print the tabulator tape. Um, if we used multiple tabulators, then we have to total those results. So there's some some math and some data entry into spreadsheets that goes that that happens at that point. And then we'll announce the unofficial results to the media and the end of the night results to the state. Um, so we send an email to all interested parties. We get the results posted to the website and social media. Um, these results do not include write in candidates at this point. Um, this year in March, we were in the office until about 10 p.m., um, which I think is early compared to a lot of other towns around the state. Um, and then within 48 hours after the election, we're required to submit um, the official results of, of the vote to the state. And then we record the results in the town record book. And I've just included an image, I don't know how easy it is to see, of just what our tabulator tape looks like for a presidential primary. Um, and again, this is just one election. Um, so what I described is relevant to just the presidential primary. Um, and there are different logistics that go into play on the same day when we're talking about town meeting day and unified school district. Um, and again, other towns um, might do a floor vote instead of doing um, instead of doing ballots. And so there's a slew of logistics that go into that as well. Um, in Brattleboro, this is the first year that we had a youth vote. So 16 and 17 year olds were allowed to vote in our local elections. Um, so, you know, pulling together logistics for that, um, petition deadlines, desi designing and proofing ballots, all of those things are happening at the same time because the presidential election is happening at the same time as all of these other elections on the same day. Um, you know, and it's important to remember that an election requires extensive planning, preparation, and communication. Um, we really need to make sure that we're maintaining the integrity of the election um, and ensuring that the public will trust in the system. Um, that's that's our primary goal um, when we're running elections. Um, so I am going to pass it over to Sarah Montgomery. Thank you, Hillary. So for this portion, we're gonna talk a little bit more about ranked choice voting implementation in Burlington. Um, this is our timeline for our history of ranked choice voting um, for the town. We're currently using it in local elections. In 2006 and 2009, Burlington was using ranked choice voting for mayoral elections only. Um, this was repealed in 2010 by a citizen initiative. So what I'll be talking about today is more about these more recent timelines. Um, we adopted ranked choice voting for city council races only in 2022, and we expanded this in 2023 to use ranked choice voting for all local official races. Um, so this now includes mayoral races, city councilors, school commission, and our local election officers. And this is a little bit more of an in-depth timeline for what our implementation process looked like for city councilors only. Um, so we started in December of 2019, the city council referred the issue of ranked choice voting to our charter change committee to flesh out a little bit more thoroughly. In July of 2020, the charter change committee provided language to city council and city council voted to put language requesting that our charter be changed to allow for ranked choice voting um, for city council elections only. This was put on our ballot at our annual city election in March of 2021. 
um, the voters approved it with 64%. And then it took until May of 2022 for this to pass through state legislation and become law. After this, we had to kind of figure out some of the implementation logistics around it and realizing that we needed a little bit more guidance about how to implement and what rules would apply to ranked choice voting in Burlington. So we brought it to our ordinance committee and the city adopted an ordinance um, to help us implement ranked choice voting. This included things like, what do you do if a voter skips a ranking? Um, so we have that all outlined in ordinance now, so we can fall back on that for our ranked choice voting rules. Our first recent election using ranked choice voting was in December 22. Um, we had a councillor resignation, so this was a special election. Um, so it was a single race for a district, which was which is two of our wards in Burlington. Um, so there were two separate voting districts voting for this councillor. So far, we've had that December election for city councilor only. Our annual city election in March of 2023 was for city councilors only. And then more recently this past March, we had our first election for all of our local officials. And while we've done ranked choice voting for all of these elections, um, the candidates have always won by 50% um, plus majority. So we've never had to actually use ranked choice tabulation to declare a winner. So some of the starting points were around outreach and education. And for this outreach, we focused heavily on voters, but we also wanted to make sure we were including our election workers, um, the candidates and members of the media. These are all groups of people in our community that this was going to affect because the expectations for how we mark our ballot, how we report results are different around ranked choice voting than we are all accustomed to using the plurality voting system. Our main outreach material was a printed, just informational document. Um, we used Ranked Choice Resource Center heavily to take information and use some images showing voters how to correctly mark a ballot in some ways that you shouldn't mark a ballot using ranked choice voting. We had this translated into Burlington's top six languages to make it a little bit more accessible to folks in our community. We also created an informational video that explained ranked choice voting um, that has also been translated into our top six languages. When we were doing the outreach, we decided that we wanted to reach out to voters as much as possible at their point of voting. So our primary focus was to kind of get this information to our voters when they were casting their ballots. So we printed this information and we posted it in our polling, um, our voting booths at our polling locations. So voters would have handy access to it as they're making those marks. We also included it in our ballot mailings to voters for our past two city elections. So we do automatically mail our local election ballots out to all of our active registered voters. So we sent that information to around 24,000 voters along with their ballot. We also had community partners that helped share the information we created, but also that created their own information and shared that out with our community. Um, and that was a really helpful resource to have other people doing the same work and helping educate our voters. And they were reaching out to our election workers and our candidates as well. So that was a big piece of it. So for voter response, when we talk about ranked choice voting, we're often thinking about the tabulation at the end and how we're gonna report results. But the majority of questions that we received were about how to mark the ballots. Um, so voters just wanted to make sure that they were able to confidently mark their ballots and that their vote would count. What we saw for some errors, and it was pretty minimal, um, we saw duplicate rankings. So a duplicate ranking is when a voter selects a candidate for their first choice, second choice, third choice, um, when they're only able to select a candidate for a single choice. What this does is just makes it so that first ranking for that candidate counts and their other ones don't count. So it doesn't completely void a ballot, but it does make it so the voter can't have those subsequent um, candidate choices. The other thing we saw some of was skipped rankings. That's when a voter chooses 
a first choice and a third choice, but they skip over that second choice. Um, we, our ordinance makes it so that if a voter skips a ranking, the subsequent rankings are pulled forward. So if a voter did that, their third choice ranking would count as their second choice ranking. The other thing that we saw as an error, and this happens in all elections, not just ranked choice voting elections, um, but was overvotes. This is when a voter casts more votes than are allowed for a candidate or in ranked choice voting for a single rank. So if there are multiple candidates and the voter selected more than one candidate as their rank one choice, that would be an overvote. In this mayoral election that we just had, we had 12 rank one overvotes compared to our other most recent mayoral elections that was higher. Um, we had three overvotes in the 2021 mayoral election and one overvote in the 2018 mayoral election. Um, so still a really, really small percentage of our votes, but it was an increased error that we saw with the rank choice ballots. On, sorry, I can go back for a sec. Thank you. And so on that graphic on the right, we can kind of see how voters were marking rankings on their ballots. The blue vote, the blue part of the bar we're seeing is where voters selected a candidate. The red part is where they left it blank. So we had um, just shy of 15,000 votes for this election. And we can see for the first rank, almost all of our voters selected a candidate. And then by the time we got to that second ranking on the ballot, almost half of the voters just left them blank from that point on. So a lot of voters just knew who they wanted to vote for and they selected their single candidate in the race. Um, but about half continued on with the ranking. And we did in this particular race, we had four candidates plus a write-in, so voters had the option of selecting five ranks. So um, rank choice results reporting, we have to do centralized tabulation. So since we have multiple polling places in Burlington, um, each using their own tabulator, what this would look like for us is waiting for our tabulators and memory cards to come back to City Hall for us as our location um, from each of our eight polling locations. And we can collate that data from the memory cards and then we can run the ranked choice tabulation for unofficial results. We can see the tabulator tape differences um, and it's a little small, but that one on the left is just from one of our voting locations for the mayoral race. So we can see the tabulator tape outlines all five ranks that were available. Um, and it's a little tricky looking at this tabulator tape because the data past the first rank isn't super helpful to members of the public. You could look at all of the tabulator tapes from all of our polling locations. And if there was no first choice, majority winner on rank one, you wouldn't be able to determine a winner. Um, so that is what centralized tabulation is. There's, we're not able to determine results at a recent level. And then that tabulator tape on the right is from our presidential primary for a single race as well. And you can see if we would put all those together, we would be able to see who had won the race um, based on whoever got the most votes. So when we're looking at those tabulator tapes, thanks Hillary, um, we can see that there's just like a whole lot more data. So this is what we're asking our election officials to report back on election night as well. So there is an increased level of reporting that takes place at our polling locations, which is taking them more time to do as well. And for our timeline, we can get unofficial results pretty quickly as soon as all of the tabulators and memory cards are centralized, we can run that report, it just takes a minute or two. It's the official results that take a little bit longer. Um, as Hillary said, we need to go back and we tally all of those individual write-ins that are marked on the ballots. And then with ranked choice voting, with those tallies, you also need to do what's called write-in adjudication. And this is where you actually have to look at the ballot images and assign the write-in candidates to each ballot that that candidate appears on. So that's a really time-consuming process that could delay official results 
probably at the city level, I would imagine we could get it done within two to three days. At the state level, that's a little bit bigger of a consideration on how that would be done. So last week, Ryan from um, Ranked Choice Resource Center shared how some tools can kind of make your results a little bit more digestible to understand. This is what the Dominion software spits out as Ranked Choice results. So we can kind of see what happens and it's really detailed, which is helpful for someone who really wants to get in the weeds with it. But we can see round by round what's happening. Um, right here, I just put the first two rounds. Um, we can see in round one that write-in is still treated as a bulk candidate. The write-in had the least amount of votes, so they were eliminated from the race. And then you can see how those votes are transferred. So out of the um, out of the 87 votes that were write-ins, seven of them went to William Emmons, three of them went to Christopher Hazley, 14 of them went to L Emma Mulvaney Stanek, and 17 went to Joan Shannon and 46 were exhausted. So those exhausted votes are folks who didn't have a second, cho second choice preference. And I will say, this is just unofficial scenario. This wasn't an actual ranked choice um, race or Mayor Emma Mulvaney Stanek won with a 50% majority. And then it just kind of goes on through the rounds until there's only two candidates remaining and whoever has the majority of the remaining vote at that point is declared the winner. So looking at some of the costs for ranked choice, it's been pretty minimal for us um, from a municipal standpoint. We had some outreach and education costs. So our video creation and translations were just under $5,000 together. We also paid to have the informational inserts included in each of our ballots that we automatically mail out to voters. This was seven cents per info sheet that we mailed. Um, this wasn't an added expense to us because like Hillary, we include an informational insert in our ballots anyway to give information to voters about where they can return their ballots. So we just added the right choice voting information onto that insert. Or um, if this wasn't being done through a mail house and we were including this, it would just be the cost of printing those um, that information. There is also a marginal increase in the cost of tabulator programming from the vendor. And ranked choice voting, if you have a lot of races on one ballot, it can get really long. So with plurality voting, you can kind of put the races side by side. With ranked choice, they need to go all the way across the paper. So if you have a lot going down the ballot, it gets long and longer ballots are more expensive. Um, that's not something we really need to worry about with the presidential primary election, but if the state were to consider it with other elections, um, that could be a consideration. And then the last piece for costs is election official time. So it is more time consuming to report out on these results and um, time costs money. So some of the challenges that we've seen with ranked choice voting in Burlington, and we're very much in the early stages of this, um, is with write-ins. It's a really time consuming process to get to that official results and to sift through those individual ballot images that have write-ins and assign the actual candidates that were voted for under that write-in line. The other thing that's not necessarily a challenge, but it's made the impact of this a little bit more limited as at a municipal level is we just haven't had a lot of candidates. So we can see in that image on the right that we had a lot of races with a single candidate or with maybe two candidates. And unless there's a really strong write-in races happening with those races, they're not gonna go to ranked choice voting tabulation. So if we don't have the candidates involved, we're not really able to utilize this new um, method of voting and tabulation. All right, so this is kind of where we get back to thinking about what this looks like at a state level. So I invite um, Sarah and Hillary back to this conversation. Thank you both so much, Hillary. It was really um, it was really important, I think, for us to understand the many and varied tasks that clerks have 
in the run-up to that presidential primary, um, but also the many different ways that clerks are administering elections on that day, um, whether it be using a tabulator or doing hand counts, whether it be uh, presidential primary and municipal officers and a municipal budget and a school budget and school officers. Um, so there's a lot going on for clerks on that March primary day. Um, and thank you so much for uh, for running through some of that for us. And, and Sarah, I think it was really um, helpful to understand um, all of the ways that voters have used um, their rank choice uh, voting. Um, it's clear, at least in your early experience in Burlington, that some voters choose not to use the ranking and instead fill out only that first choice candidate and they don't list second and third choices. And, you know, it's good to know that that doesn't disenfranchise that voter. If they really have one strong preference, they can vote for their one strong preference. And, um, and if they have other candidates who they feel, you know, would, would do a good job if their first choice doesn't win, then they can go ahead and fill out that, that ranked ballot. Um, and Sarah, it was also helpful, to, I think, for, for you to talk a little bit about the ranked choice uh, voting adoption process for Burlington, because Burlington did this through um, uh, through a, a change to their own uh, city charter. And so, of course, any any community in Vermont that has um, has a municipal charter could adopt ranked choice voting as a way of uh, selecting their candidates uh, if they choose to. Um, I would love to let's let's stop share and if that's the end of your slideshow, and then we can go to just the three of us on uh, on camera here as we answer some of the questions that have been coming through. Um, you know, I I I hope that if anything that either of you said sparked a, you know, another bit of information that you'll just jump in and, and say, you know, yes, we also should talk about, you know, X, Y, or Z would welcome you to do that. Um, and I will jump into some of the questions that we've gotten from, uh, from the Q and A. So at this point, folks, if you are on the webinar and you have a question that you'd like to ask either generally about RCV or specifically about, uh, the presentation or uh, from the perspective of a clerk, you can go ahead and use that Q&A function and start answering questions. And um, and I will try to pull them out in somewhat of a logical order so that we can go through uh, Q&A here uh, as a group. Um, so there was uh, an interesting question about how you choose candidates to be listed on the ballot. That that question um, to me means, you know, how does somebody become qualified to run for office, which is different if you're running for, you know, Ward 7 City Council in Burlington than it is if you're running for president. And so I will answer that question of how you get on the ballot to run for president, because that comes through the Secretary of State's office. And then if either of you or both of you want to talk about how people become qualified to be on your local ballots, since we did talk a little bit about local ballots. Um, uh, in Vermont, our statute is very clear that anyone who files the consent of candidate form with all of the uh, requisite fields filled in and uh, and pays their filing fee um, to the Secretary of State's office is uh, is able to be on our presidential primary ballot. Um, and so that's a little different than being qualified to run for state representative or um, United States House of Representatives uh, or Vermont State Senate. Um, in those races, uh, people also bring in petitions with signatures of Vermont voters saying, I agree for this person's name to be placed on the ballot. Uh, for the presidential primary, it's uh, it's a little more straightforward. Um, 
we know that a lot of presidential candidates go to New Hampshire during the during the primary season, uh, but it's pretty rare for us to see uh, presidential candidates actually here in Vermont. Uh, so we, we don't have that requirement for actual petition signatures. Um, but Sarah or Hillary, how do people get on the ballot in other races? Um, so I, I would say it's a similar process. Um, they have to circulate a petition, um, get a certain number of signatures from registered voters in the town or in the district where they're running. Um, and depending on what they're running for determines um, how many signatures they need. Um, and, you know, a, a state rep will be submitting their petition back to the town clerks, whereas somebody running for state senate will submit it elsewhere. Um, so the rules sort of depend for local elections. They're taking out their petitions from the town clerk, returning them to the town clerk. And as long as they get the valid signatures, their name is on the ballot. Sarah, what do you, how do people get on your ballot? Yeah, same process. We have um, the deadline set by statute and folks need to submit their consent of candidate, their petition mm -hmm. forms, and any party endorsements for Burlington if they're running under the name of a major political party. Excellent. Um, so we had a question in the chat that um, that's going to take us back a little bit to last week. Um, and so I want to cover that first because I think uh, there might be other people on uh, on our webinar today who who weren't able to be with us last week. But what is the benefit of ranked choice voting? Um, so if somebody didn't come last week, uh, you can see the recording of the webinar from last week. But um, Sarah or Hillary, do you want to jump in and talk a little bit about what you think the benefit of ranked choice voting is for the voter? Yeah, I can start there. Um, part of the benefit for ranked choice voting for the voter is that they they have the opportunity to make multiple selections. So they can really vote their first rank as the candidate that they like best, even though it might not be the candidate that they think is going to win. So if that candidate gets eliminated in that first round or second round, they're still able to have that vote go, or, go toward their second favorite candidate. So it just gives the voter a little bit more say in who that final winner of the race is. Yeah, and and I would add um, that you know it it helps people do away with that sort of strategic voting, um, like Sarah's saying about you know I want this candidate, but they're not going to win, or I don't think they're going to win, and now maybe that candidate will win um, because people have the ability to vote that way. Um, another benefit that I've heard quite a bit is campaigning um, has the potential to become a lot more civil um, because the candidates really have to talk about themselves and their their platforms and their merits, because if they start talking negatively about their opponents, right they they want to be somebody's second choice if they're not going to be the first choice. And talking negatively about their opponents means that they might lose somebody's vote for their second ranking. Um, so it it really encourages candidates to really promote themselves and their platforms and not tear down their opponents. Yeah, so that's interesting. So we have we have um, advantages for voters. And we also have um, maybe advantages for candidates, or at least advantages for the uh, the public dialogue around elections. Um, you know, it's always it's always more important to hear from a candidate what they will do if they are elected, than to hear from a candidate saying bad things about someone who they think you shouldn't vote for. Um, and so, you know, we've heard a lot of people talk about the benefits of RCV being that it really encourages people to think about candidates to think about speaking about themselves more than and what they will do as opposed to pulling down um, a candidate. Um, 
So here's a question that I think should go to Sarah because uh, it appears to have popped up while you were uh, talking about the experience with uh, with voters in Burlington for your first um, a couple of RCV elections. Does an overvote invalidate the choice for that position completely? So how our ordinance is set up, an overvote is treated like a skipped ranking. Um, so if a voter overvotes their first ranking but has a selection for their second ranking still, that second rank choice is actually going to move forward to their first choice. Um, so that's how Burlington set up set it up. There are other options to set it up in a traditional plurality race. If somebody overvotes for a race, it does invalidate their vote um, because there's no way to tell what the voter intent is in that scenario. Yeah, so let's put this on the list of things that we need to figure out uh, as we work through the details of ranked choice voting for the 2028 presidential primary. Um, there's a question here about S32, which of course was the previous iteration of ranked choice voting. Um, and S32 has not been signed into law. Um, S32 actually um, ended its path forward last, um, last year at the end of session. And, um, and so that was not brought up again this year. And uh, the part of the reason for that is that we don't open up and change election law during an election year. And if you remember back to the beginning of Hillary's timeline about when this election year started, this election year started really in you know November, December, with candidates filing to be on the presidential primary. So, um, so there it was no election law change this year, um, and so our next opportunity to talk about ranked choice voting will come with the introduction of a bill. Uh, in January of next year when the legislature comes back into session. Um, let's see, what are some proposed uh, technology solutions to avoid overvoting errors? Is there, is there a way of, uh, of helping to avoid overvoting errors? Is there a technology way? I'm sure that there's a voter education way. Yes, there is already our tabulators. When you feed a ballot through, it will um, give voters messages if they made an error on their ballot. And one of those messages is for overvotes. So the tabulator has a little screen and it will say you overvoted this race or this rank. Um, when, it, when that's at the polling place and the voter sees that message, they have the opportunity to fix their ballot and get a new one to vote again. The problem happens more when we're receiving absentee ballots because we don't have the voter with us at this point. So when the election officials are processing those ballots and they see the overvote message on the tabulator, there isn't an opportunity for the voter to fix it at that point. Sure. And if, if I can just jump in and, and add a little bit of clarification to that, one thing that's important to know is by the time we're processing those absentee ballots and putting them through the tabulator, they have been separated from the envelope. And so there's not even a way for us to know who voted that ballot for us to contact them and ask them their intent. Exactly. And that's by design to make sure that people's votes are anonymous and private. Um, we, we shouldn't know how they voted. Exactly. Yeah, that's a very important point. Um, and it's part of the processing of absentee ballots that I think um, many people don't uh, don't understand if they haven't actually worked the polls and and understand that you you turn that that ballot envelope over so that you can't see the person's name on it and then you take the ballot out of the envelope um, so that you don't look at what that ballot says um, at the same time that you're looking at who cast that ballot. Um, let's see. I have a couple other questions. Um, so here's an interesting question. Will this voting tabulator technology be available to all towns within Vermont for access needs for persons with disabilities and other access needs like plain language for people with ADHD, autism, or learning needs? 
Um, so that's a fabulous question. And one that, uh, that between you as clerks and between our office and uh, folks advocating for um, is one that, that we should be considering together. So to what extent do you see people, um, Sarah, in, in Burlington, uh, you know, people who might need more assistive technology or plain language instructions uh, in your short time period of administering RCV elections? It doesn't seem to be a huge need. We have our accessible voting machines, which address certain needs for people, certainly not all of them um, that aren't heavily utilized. We have them used a few times per election. I think often people will need information translated for them and they'll bring someone with them who can help them do that or they'll vote absentee where they have options to get the assistance they need with that as well. I think we could definitely do more for accessibility though. And I think that's something that we should work on all together. For sure. Um, so for the folks who are with us tonight who might not know what our accessible voting system is, um, what types of voters do you see using your accessible voting machine and uh, in the work that you've done with it, um, how do you see it being useful for people who might have disabilities or, uh, or need a little bit of extra assistance, either either one of you. Um, so Sarah, I will let you speak to this because we actually haven't seen our accessible voting machines being used. They're available, um, they're signs up, they're available to anybody. Somebody doesn't have to have a need in order to use it. Um, they could just be a tech savvy person who would prefer to vote using, we sort of call it a glorified tablet or a glorified pen, um, because it's not connected to the internet. It's, it is it is simply a way to vote and print out a ballot. That ballot gets commingled with all of the other ballots. Um, but we haven't in Brattleboro seen anybody use them thus far. My experience with folks who have utilized it have mostly been low vision. So they can use the audio and the features to help them vote that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the other... Uh, other access thing that I've seen more is people needing help understanding the language of the ballot questions. I mm -hmm. think we can all agree that sometimes they get a little bit like wordy and complicated and the language of them isn't so accessible. So I think that question is also getting at just making that language a little bit more digestible for folks. Um, and right. That and might be have... a variety of needs, including language needs. Yeah, we've, we've definitely seen that as well, where we've had voters approach poll workers and say, I know the result that I want. Um, I want this thing to happen or not happen. Do I vote yes or no? And we can't answer that question for them. And I, I agree. I think it's really about how do we simplify the language um, to make it accessible and understandable. Right. Because especially when we've seen those constitutional amendments um, right. that are very much in legal language, um, it can become hard for someone to understand uh, exactly what that's right. saying. The challenge becomes when it's an article that was added to the ballot through petition, the language on the ballot needs to be the exact language that was on the petition. And True. we have no say as to what that language was. Mm hmm Yep. And I suppose in that case, you hope that the people who petitioned to have that language put on the ballot will stick around long enough to educate their fellow voters on what that question was all about and what they're trying to accomplish. Um, the, the, the joys of democracy, sometimes it, it can be really hard. <laughs> um, so here's a question that um, that was from Hillary's presentation. And um, and I'm thinking back to uh, as you were talking about the many steps that you need to take when you are making sure that the absentee ballots that were received have been tabulated. Um, so this question is, what does balance the absentee ballots mean? So that's a good question. So um, we have a number of different checks and balances and tracking systems. 
Um, so we have um, some of our BCA members are in our office daily during the absentee voting process. And when ballots come in, we will date stamp them. Um, we will sort them by district alphabetically, um, which ballots are supposed to be in there based on the label. So we sort of, we sort them in different ways. Um, and then we'll have a sticky note that says how many ballots should, how many envelopes should be in there. Um, and then one of our staff members will data enter all of that information into the statewide elections database. Um, and then, you know, we'll double check that the numbers match the numbers on the sticky note. We'll count the ballots to make sure that it's all accurate. Um, and then we will print out the list from the state system when we're getting ready to actually open those ballots and put them through the tabulator. Um, and we'll, we'll cross check that list against the envelopes to make sure that every ballot that we think we have, we actually have. Um, when we're not processing them, they get locked in the vault. Um, and then once the ballots are separated from the envelopes and they go through the tabulator, we have a log that tells us how many ballots we think we put through, how many envelopes we have, and what the tabulator number says went through. And so we'll cross check all of those numbers on a daily basis. We always have at least two people involved in every step of the process. Um, and so it's it's definitely time consuming. It's very detail focused. And we're constantly just cross checking and cross checking and checks and balances um, to make sure that you know, a ballot doesn't disappear, doesn't fall under a desk somewhere and, and we lose track of it. You would recognize that because yes. you know how many envelopes were sent back and and you know how many ballots for the school vote you should have and how many for the presidential primary. And you can double check, triple and check. And make sure that we've data entered all of those into the system. If our numbers don't match, did we skip data entering one? Did I get distracted by a member of the public coming in and I picked back up in the wrong place? You know, human error happens. Um, and so we really want to make sure that we have those checks and balances in place to catch our errors. Yeah. Yeah, you know, one of the things that I try to explain to folks when they ask if Vermont's elections are secure and safe um, is, you know, I, I try to explain this process of how you keep track of ballots that have gone out and how many have been received and who did you receive a ballot from so that if you received a ballot in the mail uh, from John Q. Smith, um, and then John Q. Smith shows up on election day and asks for another ballot, you can flag that and you can figure out how is it that I show that you've already voted. In fact, I heard a great story from a clerk um, a, a year or so ago, and she said that uh, a sweet, sweet little old lady came in to vote on election day. And, and she said, well, Marjorie, um, I, I show that you've already voted. And Marjorie got really mad. You know, I have not voted and I want my ballot right now. And so this clerk went over to her bin of absentee envelopes and said, is this your signature? Is this your? And Marjorie said <gasps> she had forgotten that she had voted. Um, and so, you know, we really do have a lot of checks in place uh, so that human error can occasionally occur on the voter side as well. Um, and we've got a lot of people who are keeping tabs on um, on how many people have voted and who they are and how many ballots we should have and, and you know, do our totals match. And so you're looking at those undervotes to make sure that you actually have all of those ballots, right? So, so we're, not, we're not looking at under votes because we don't get the results of the of the vote until election night after the polls close. Right. There's no way to know who got how many votes and how many undervotes or overvotes there were. There, there's just no way for us to know that. Um, but we're counting. I mean, our last election in March, people requested the school ballot 
it was mailed to them and then they realized, oh, I don't actually know anybody on here. I'm not going to vote, but I'll send my school ballot back. And so there were a number of blank ballots that got fed through the tabulator. Um, and those still get counted as a ballot that was returned that was voted. Mm -hmm. um, we're just not going to know what what those numbers are until after the polls close. And that is also intentional um, because we don't want to have a clue who's in the lead as we get into election day. Right. So we've talked about how a normal presidential primary um, works right now and all of the many things that are going on. And we've talked a little bit about Burlington's experience. Um, it was interesting uh, to me to, to observe that while Burlington had RCV in place, there really was a clear winner who got, you know, 50% plus one vote. Um, and so you didn't need to kick into all of those ranking tabulations. Um, and so in that way, you know, having RCV, if you have a really strong candidate, it doesn't really change anything, right? It gives people the opportunity to say who they would like if their first choice candidate is eliminated. But, um, but in some cases, it doesn't. It doesn't uh, change the outcome if if there is a strong first place winner. Um, so let's talk for just a few minutes here. We're at eight o'clock and, and I will keep an eye out for any other questions that come into the Q&A. But let's talk about some of the some of the questions that will need to be answered for all of the other communities who aren't with us here tonight, all of the other clerks who uh, who aren't here. So we have Brattleboro and Burlington, um, you know, north part of the state, south part of the state, larger communities with multiple voting, um, uh, uh, many, many voters and multiple tabulators that you use. Um, so let's talk for a minute about the, you know, suppose we fast forward to 2028 and we still have a number of communities that, uh, that do a hand count because for, every other election, uh, you know, counting the ballots for 75 or 100 people just doesn't doesn't seem worth it to take the time and expense of uh, programming a tabulator and and, you know, running the ballots through. Uh, what are some of the things that come to your mind about the questions that we will want the legislature to consider um, as we move towards ranked choice voting statewide for a presidential primary? I would think that a big one um, is, you know, Sarah talked about how time consuming it is um, to figure out what to do with those write-in candidates. Um, in Brattleboro, our charter for local elections allows us to um, only record the votes for somebody who has declared their intent to run as a write-in candidate. They have to do that by the time the polls close on election day. They can email us. They can um, call us. They can fill out a form in person. They can send us the information by carrier pigeon. Um, <laughs> as long as we have their information and it's clear that they're intending to run as a write-in candidate, we will we will tally their votes and um, it's no problem. And I think that that's something that the legislature really needs to consider um, yes. If we are moving towards ranked choice voting, just don't put the carrier pigeon in the ballot box. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Sarah? Any uh, any thoughts on other things that the legislature really needs to consider going forward? I think what we probably didn't do as much on the front end as we should have is think about like all those little rules. Um, so what are you going to do with overvotes and skipped rankings? Um, so having that all thought out in advance is really helpful to have. The other big piece that I think we all think about all the time is how are we going to do centralized tabulation with such a large geographic area, um, either getting all of those memory cards to one location or getting all the ballots to one location or whatever combination that ends up happening. But in the timeline that we're able to get unofficial results out and official results out based on having to collate all that um, data. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, a possible way forward would be for the first choice ranking to, to be reported in the way that it is now. Um, and then for all of the 
um, memory cards to be brought together so that we can look at, you know, maybe the first choice shows that there is a clear winner um, and, and that we don't need to go into a ranked choice calculation. Um, but, uh, but bringing those memory cards together is a bit of a challenge. Um, you know, Canaan is pretty far away. Um, and you know, there's, there's some places that are far distant from, uh, from Montpelier. And so what I've understood from other states that have done ranked choice voting is that they have actually, um, uh, had law enforcement officers transporting those very important, uh, either all of the ballots or the memory cards, um, in a secure way so that we know that there's no chance of one getting lost or, uh, or a bag of ballots going missing. Mm -hmm. And thinking about, you know, I mean, I know some of the other states that do this are in similar geographic areas, um, but our elections are in March, right? Um, we have elections in November. We live in Vermont. There's potential for weather. Um, and so how are we transporting in a safe way in, in that sense as well? So that if there's a major snowstorm or ice storm, people aren't being unsafe in transporting ballots at that time. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would also think, I, I would like to be thinking sort of longer term, right? I'd like to assume that if this passes um, and if we're doing this in 2028, I would like to assume that it is wildly successful and everybody loves it um, and we move towards using it more um, mm -hmm. because consistency with elections is really important to me. Um, I think that, like I said, every election is so drastically different um, and the voters can get confused. Um, poll workers can get confused as to what's happening at each election. Um, and one of the things that I've heard in the past um, is rank choice voting allows you to rank up to 10 choices. Mm. And I think that at least at least with the um, technology that we currently have. Um, and I'd like to think about, you know, longer term, if this is successful, let's not think about this election in a silo, but let's make sure that when we think about voting for justice of the peace, which is in many towns vote for not more than 15. Mm -hmm. In Brattleboro, we have representative town meeting, which can be vote for not more than 14, 15 or 16. Um, what will happen if we decide, hey, we want to do this for local elections, and now the technology doesn't allow us to. Um, so I'd like to be thinking longer term and not just about the presidential primary. Right. So the way we had envisioned moving towards ranked choice voting for the presidential primary is that we would have the legislature um, direct our office to lead a group of stakeholders. Um, who would come together and really think through some of these uh, some of these implementation issues? You know, are we transporting ballots to a central location? Are we uh, are we providing tabulators to every single community, regardless of size, so that all we have to tr transport is is a memory stick? Um, do we transport ballots to a, a a, you know, a, a countywide central location, or do we bring all the ballots to Montpelier? And as you said, Hillary, sometimes the weather can be a little bit sketchy in, in March. And so, um, you know, the further we're transporting ballots, the, you know, the longer it might take. Some of the other issues that I think um, folks need to be aware of is that we we, we may not know the results of a particular presidential primary on election night, on primary night in 2028, right? Um, Sarah's had the experience of having RCB in place but not needing to use it because somebody got more than 50% of the vote, uh, but that doesn't necessarily happen in a multi-way presidential primary. So then, 
not only do we need to educate voters before they come to the polling place, but we need them to understand um, after polls close what to expect. I think we'll also need to look to the parties to understand, you know, what they're doing with delegates and how, how because the parties do things in different ways, right? And it's really up to them. And so we would need to work with them to understand what the rules are and how we're educating the voters and how we're educating our poll workers and town clerks um, to make sure. And, and I think that's one of the reasons why, you know, initially this was looking to be passed and implemented right away. Um, and it's one of the things that the Vermont Municipal Clerks and Treasurers Association felt really strongly about was, you know, we're not going to speak in favor or opposed to ranked choice voting. It was the timeline, right? And that like my my last slide was talking about trust and integrity uh of the voters in the election process. And we really need to make sure that we're taking our time and we're, we're having these study committees that you're talking about. And we're giving the deep thought into a, an already very complicated process to how we do this thoughtfully, methodically, um, and make sure that all of our I's are dotted and our T's are crossed. Um, Because that integrity is is just so integral to what we do. Absolutely. You know, it's very important at the end of the day that um, that that we can tell the story of how we know Vermont's elections are accurate and secure um, and that the results that are being certified are a direct reflection of the ballots that were cast and Mm -hmm. um, and adding you know, adding complications and and doing that in a way that doesn't allow for people to understand what uh, what that rationale is uh, it can can undermine people's confidence in our elections. Yeah. So here we are at eight fifteen or so. Um, any other any other final thoughts from you on things that we should be questions that we should be answering? Um, you know, between now and and 2028. So it's entirely possible that between now and uh, and when we use ranked choice voting, if we get this through the legislature and use ranked choice voting for the 2028 presidential primary, it's entirely possible that other communities might have already adopted ranked choice voting for their local elections. So it's possible that more people will be familiar with it. Um, So from from your perspective in Burlington and Brattleboro, um, you know, what are some of the varied ways that we will get this information out to voters? Are we talking about mailing uh, something to every voter? Are we talking about inserts just with those absentee ballots and then we'll do in-person education at the polls? Are we talking about PSAs and radio spots or posters in the polling place? What are, what are some of the things that you think would be effective at helping people understand um, if they show up to vote in 2028, why their ballot looks different? I think we found it helpful to get the information out to all of the voters who are voting. Um, so I would suggest doing something similar if we were going to implement something on such a large scale. I think I had talked to people about implementation and some people had done like signs on the side of buses too in other bigger jurisdictions. So I think you could go really big with advertising too. But the most important thing I think is just to get the information to the voters who are voting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think we have an audience, right? We know we know who's currently voting. Um, And so having information at the polls, being active, not just necessarily having things posted in booths, because we have so many signs in our voting booths, right? How how can we engage voters at the polls, make sure that they're aware, um, send something to everybody who requests an absentee ballot, or if you're a town that mails to everybody, um, when we mail ballots to everybody in November, right? Um, How can we include this information there? Um, I think like Sarah said, the nonprofit engagement 
when I was working on this in Maine, I was working for a nonprofit organization and we would have big parties with bands and we had all of the local bakeries donate mini cupcakes and people could do taste tests. And then we had ballots made up and they could vote through ranked choice voting on their favorite cupcake. Um, and then they got to see us tally the results and see how that worked. Um, and so I think that the more we can engage the public um, and really reach out to the people who are voting anytime somebody registers to vote, if it's through the DMV or in person, right? If we're sending them material, um, hey, you registered to vote, this is where your polling location is, include an insert. Um, somebody registers to vote at the counter, we hand them information. Um, I think we just really need to reach our voters in every way, shape or form because different people pay attention to different things. And no matter what, there will be people who show up to the polls and are surprised. It's true because we still hear those pesky stories about people who forget that in our presidential primary, you need to declare which party you wish to vote in. Unlike your August primary, when you get all three ballots and you get to choose. Um, and so we still do hear of people, don't we, that who get agitated that they need to declare, I want to vote the Republican ballot or I want to vote the Democrat ballot. Um, frustrating, but that is sort of the way of the world. Um, so here's an interesting question in the chat. Um, do the two major parties want RCV for the 2028 primary? Have they vo voiced any thoughts on that? Um, I haven't perceived uh, a strong uh, yay or nay from either of the parties in Vermont. Um, and I'm wondering, Sarah or Hillary, in your experience of talking about ranked choice voting with people, do you see a, a tendency of either party to favor or disfavor ranked choice voting? I haven't gotten any impressions either way. Yeah, I mean, one of the interesting things about registering to vote in Vermont is you don't register and affiliate with a particular party. Right. And so I don't necessarily know what party affiliation people lean towards when I have conversations with them. I can tell you that at our representative town meeting this year, um, under other business, which is advisory only, um, they asked us to consider um, looking into and doing education around ranked choice voting for the entire state and that coming from the legislature. Um, it's a small group of people. It's, you know, max 140 people voting out of our 9,000 voters. Um, and it didn't pass unanimously. Um, but there is definitely interest in Brattleboro, but I don't know which parties that's coming from. Yeah. So I'm going to end on one last question, and it's kind of a sticky question. So I'm going to welcome you to uh, to 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 really dive into this with me. Um, and and the way this question is asked is sort of um, asking whether ranked choice voting is creating an artificial majority. Um, does somebody being able to get across that 50% plus one threshold through ranked choice voting uh, constitute an artificial majority. Um, and, you know, as I think about it, I look, I look at a ranked choice ballot and I think of the possibility of, you know, maybe there are some sort of establishment candidates who are on that ballot and then maybe there's, you know, some some new people, some young people, some dynamic young leaders who are stepping into the political fray. They maybe they don't have as much money as those establishment candidates, but they have some really good values and uh, and and they're really passionate about what they're uh, what they're campaigning on. And to me, ranked choice voting uh, allows someone to say, hey, I want to vote for that new, fresh, you know, 
person who does, you know, is not one of those establishment candidates, but whose values really closely match my own. Um, and if that person doesn't make it past that first round, I don't want to have wasted my vote because I really do have a preference among some of these establishment candidates. Um, so to me, uh, you know, I, I would say that it's not really an artificial majority. If I want to vote my heart and vote for, you know, this, this young, fresh candidate, but then I know that one of these people is going to be more likely to have the momentum, then I'll give one of those people my second or third choice vote. Um, but it allows me to vote my passion for that first candidate um, and and then not have that be my only opportunity to 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 help sort the remaining ones. So tell me what you think about this concept of of rank choice voting creating an artificial majority. Yeah, that's definitely a tricky one. Um, I think when we're voting plurality, we're not necessarily seeing that full majority. So we're not seeing that 50% when we're voting plurality too. So this just gives a little bit more opportunity for everybody to get a little bit of what they want, if not fully what they want. Um, I think the opportunity here is that voters can come together and kind of meet on a middle ground if they're not fully agreeing on one side or the other. And it gives those candidates an opportunity to move forward. Yeah, because if you, you know, if you think about a plurality race in in the scenario with four candidates, you know, you could conceivably see somebody winning with 26% of the vote if everybody got if 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 the other candidates got 25 or 24% of the vote. Um that doesn't feel like any expression of a majority. Yeah. Hillary, any any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, I think about a lot of people saying, oh, well, if I vote for the person that I'm passionate about, it's throwing my vote away and giving my vote to the person that I disagree with the most. And this gives people a choice. And a lot of people look at it and think, oh, well, it's giving somebody more than one vote. Mm. right? And it's not. Your vote is only counted once, once one ballot round. and right. yeah. if your first choice gets the least number of votes it gets eliminated and your vote still counts you then get your vote to like it goes to your second choice you're not voting for your first choice second choice and third choice um you're just voting for one at a time and um so i think that's just a really important distinction uh and I agree. I think that somebody, if you have multiple candidates and somebody winning by 25%, like, or somebody winning with 25% of the vote is, is not a majority. Um, and this almost gives a, a better sense of what the voters want. Mm -hmm. But again, it needs to be done carefully and slowly and cautiously. Which is the exact reason why I am so thankful that you two were here with us for this conversation tonight, because I really wanted uh, people who are interested in ranked choice voting and curious about it to have an opportunity to understand all of the many steps that go into running a successful election in Vermont. Um, and so who better to ask than the people who are doing this work on the local level? Um, and so I want to say thank you, thank you so much for being with us tonight. And um, I think that is the end of the questions that have come through, uh, at least at, as far as they've popped up in front of me. And so I think we should uh, sign off any parting words that you want to say about ranked choice voting. Oh, thank you for inviting us to join tonight. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise. A great big thank you to the League of Women Voters for uh, helping us put on this forum. Um, participants will be able to see a recording of the forum tonight after, uh, after it, it gets done with all of its finishing productions. And uh, so I will turn it back over to Sue to close us out. Thank you all for attending today's program. In wrapping up the evening, I want to thank our presenters, Hillary,
Frances and Sarah Montgomery, our Secretary of State, Sarah Copeland Panzers, and her staff, Brian Mills and Wesley Dunn, Orca Media, and Betty Keller with the League of Women Voters. You will find a recording of today's webinar and the previous webinar, Ranked Choice Voting and Overview, on the websites of Secretary of State and the League of Women Voters, as well as on our YouTube channel. Thank you all for attending and have a good evening. Good night.